Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Natalia Balabanova from University of Toledo, and she's going to talk about um, point vertices on non-oriented manifolds. Okay. <coughs> Uh, well, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk at this seminar. And the topic of this talk is, yeah, point vortices and non-orientable surfaces. And this is the result of my joint work with my now former uh, scientific supervisor, James Montaldi from the University of Manchester. And well, yeah, first of all, let's kick off with a little bit of motivation because um, for, there are two main approaches to describing the flow of incompressible fluid of constant density, right? One of them is going through, oh, sorry, one of them is going through Euler equations on an area in Rn, we will take it as R2, or Arnold's approach to fluid dynamics, where, in where um, flows of incompressible fluid are perceived as elements of uh, the group S diff of M, which, are, which is the group of volume preserving diffeomorphisms of M. That means that it preserves the absolute value of the, vo of the parallelogram, if you will, that is built upon some three or N vectors, depending on the dimension of M. And the catch is, none of these approaches actually demands that the manifold in question be orientable, because Euler equation demand that the manifold be Riemannian, and Arnold's approach demands that it has a density, so we can estimate the volume, absolute volume of the set parallelogram. But there are a couple of notions of hydrodynamics, for example, vorticity, which I will talk about in detail, that are not so readily generalized to non-orientable surfaces. And there are a couple of other things that we have to redefine in order to, point, to put point vortices in non-orientable manifold. So, oh, I forgot to erase, but first of all, let us remind ourselves what point vortices are. So this should be two pi in here. So point vortex is a very specific fluid flow. Uh, its vector field is given by the tangential component of this vector field is gamma over two pi r and the radial component is zero. So what happens is we are effectively circling around one point like so, in, ah, sorry, this is point vortices in the plane. So natural habitat of point vortices is the plane. And in there, the vector field looks like this. As I said, the general component is gamma over two pi r, radial component is zero. So we're effectively circling around one point, which we usually denote by x zero and call the center of the point vortex. And the further we are removed from this, from the center of the point vortex, uh, the slower we go. An alternative way of putting it is saying that the vorticity omega of point vortex flow of a solitary point vortex is given by gamma delta of x zero of x, where x zero is the point vortex center. And gamma is a scalar constant, which we usually call point vortex strength. Um, we usually draw point vortices in this way, on the plane. So center x1, say x2, x3, and write their point vortex strength next to them, next to them, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three. Now, gamma tells us two very important things. First of all, it obviously, from the previous slide, tells us how, fa how fast we're going around the center, right? Because the tangential component of velocity is proportional to it. And second, and the most important bit of information for us is the following. If we set in the plane, if we set an orientation and have our point vortex, if it is going anti-clockwise, then the sine of gamma is great, well, gamma is greater than zero. If it is going counterclock, uh, sorry, if it's going clockwise, then gamma is less than zero. So on orientable manifolds, the sign of with a fixed orientation, gamma tells us whether we're going anti-clockwise or clockwise. And oh yeah, and I forgot to mention that delta of x zero of x is the Dirac delta function. So it is zero when x zero is not equal to x and infinity when, is, when it is equal to x. So it's practically indicating whether x zero coincides with x. So this is the same thing, but written. And the wonderful thing is that this setup 
vorticity-wise, predominantly, can be generalized to arbitrary surfaces, really, because we can consider we can consider point vortices on steers, flat and curved tori, uh, arbitrary surfaces of genus G, and so on and so forth. Um, they have been very well described. And now the most interesting thing for us is that the system of point vortices on an orientable manifold is a Hamiltonian system. So the interpol of coordinates, centers of the vortices, uh, their dynamics follow the streamlines of a Hamiltonian vector field, if this makes sense. So, and what do we need for a Hamiltonian system? Well, we need this symplectic form, right? We need the phase space of this Hamiltonian system, and we need the Hamiltonian itself. So in the most general case, uh, we have, so let's try to describe those, right? We have an orientable manifold M tilt, which will be our most general case. So there is our orientable manifold M tilt, and there are a couple of vortices strewn about. So we suppose that their centers are x1, x2, and all the way up to xn. And the vorticities are respectively gamma 1, gamma 2, and all the way to gamma n. Now, the phase space, and since we're describing the dynamics of centers of the point vortices, right, the phase space has to have all the possible configurations of our system. So it automatically will be n copies of m tilt, Right, because our point vortices can be anywhere on the manifold. And then we have to subtract the set delta, which we call the diagonal. And this set delta is given by all the n tuples, x1, xn, such that xi is equal, some xi is equal to xj. So delta is the set of possible collisions of centers of the point vortices. And we are not allowing for that because Hamiltonian, uh, the Hamiltonian will have a singularity as we will see in a bit. Now, the symplectic form is very easy. Uh, the symplectic form will just be the direct sum of the of copies of symplectic form on each copy of M tilde, and they're weighted down by the, and they're weighted by their respective gammas, which are going to be scalars. Now, the Hamiltonian is a slightly another matter. Uh, it has a more complicated form. So once again, we suppose that centers are x1, uh, x1, xn, and point vortice strengths are gamma 1 and gamma n, some scalars. And the Hamiltonian then is going to be equal to the sum minus uh, gamma i, gamma j, g of xi, xj, minus 1 half gamma j squared of bar of xj, where g of xi, xj is the Green's function on the manifold m tilde, i.e. by definition, the function, the Laplacian of which at the point x gives us Dirac delta function. Uh, so we apply Green's function to the centers of the point vortices, multiply them by their point vortex strength, and then subtract this mysterious thing over here, which we'll talk about in a moment. So the physical, the physical meaning of this Green function in here, this, part of the Hamiltonian is the interaction between two different point vortices, right? So xi and xj. So how the two point vortices interact is described by this Green's function. But what might happen, but what happens on some surfaces when we have a solitary point vortex on them? Because especially when a surface has a boundary, right? So if this is the entire surface, point vortex will rotate the fluid around it and it will sort of crash into the boundary and it will result in self-interaction of a point vortex, right? So it will somehow affect itself by the virtue of the existence of the boundary. And this amount is exactly what expresses this self-interaction. We call this thing the Robin function. And by definition, this Robin function R of X is going to be equal to limit with Y tending to X, Green's function minus one over two pi logarithm of geodesic distance between X and Y. So uh, Green's function by its definition here has to have a singularity 
when x is coin x coincides with y, right? Because we will give we will get the delta function. And this singularity has ordered precisely one over two pi logarithm of geodesic distance. So by subtracting it, we are in the Taylor series, de facto, we are desingularizing green function and defining it at the point x. So yeah, that's that's precisely what I said. Robin's function is the desingularization of the green function, and it describes the interaction between of the interaction between a single point vortex and the boundary of the surface, and the resulting interaction between the point vortex and itself. And it is the only reason why a point a solitary point vortex may be non-stationary in some surface. Um, a quite lame example is again on the plane, where Green's function for the plane is one over two pi logarithm of Euclidean distance between x and y. Right. So if we subtract this Euclidean distance, Robin's function will immediately turn zero, and therefore on the plane, a solitary vortex will be stationary. So it will rotate all the fluid around it, but it will not affect itself or it will not interact with anything. Oh yeah, but by the way, like if there are any questions, please feel very free to interrupt me. <laughs> so this is the classical setup for an orientable manifold, but as I said, this, is, this has all been formulated on an orientable manifold. So what do we do when the manifold is non-orientable? Well, we need the things that are called twisted objects. So let's try and let's remember what they are. Uh, now, we consider a non-orientable manifold M and it's orientable double cover M tilde, which I'm going to be drawing like this very primitively. Uh, and it will be a connected manifold because M, M is non-orientable. And there is the standard projection pi from M tilde down to M, where we consider the preimage of x of a point x on M under pi will be two points x prime and x double prime belonging to M tilde. And then we introduce a very uh, particular object, x double prime. So let tau be an anti symplectic, symplectic involution of M tilde. So tau has order two, it sends m tilde to m tilde. And what it does is it exchanges the two preimages of the point x, right? So applying tau to two preimages of the point x is geometrically the same as changing orientation in a small neighborhood U of a point x in m because these two points, by definition, locally have different orientations. So that's the geometric meaning of tau. And sometimes we will write preimage of x as x prime and x double prime, or sometimes we will write it as x prime and tau of x prime, because these are one and the same. Now, uh, the simplest example, which is our working model of a Mobius band, so the one, the model of the Mebius band that we adopt is a stripe, is a strip, I always confuse these words, with oppositely oriented sides, right? And if we draw the line y equals zero, then we're identifying this point here with this point here with the opposite y coordinate, and that belongs to the other side. And we call this thing imaginary boundary. So, Double cover of the Möbius band, of this model of the Möbius band, is a cylinder, right? Because we take one copy of the Möbius band and then flip it over, and we can glue these, and gluing these sides together, we'll get a cylinder. So this point here will be x, and well, it will be x prime as well, right? Because we're including one copy of the Möbius band here. This point, and it will have so this will be one part of the preimage, and this will be the other part of the preimage, which we will denote by x double prime. So if we suppose that this length is pi r in here, right, then tau of, um, let's say, x0, y0, of the point with coordinates x0, y0, is going to be x0 plus pi r and minus 
y0, right? So we are reflecting, so we're reflecting everything and moving it, shifting it pi r to the left. So yeah, this is this written in a better handwriting. Now, um, let's return to our m tilt and our m. So once again, we have x, we have x double prime, oh, x prime and x double prime. Now, um, we have regular objects on M, right? Such as vector fields for N, well, whatever, N forms, functions, and so on and so forth. Uh, for example, like for, on a two dimensional manifold, there will be no non degenerate two forms, but uh, there will be no subjective form, for example, but uh, there will be degenerate forms. And they can be lifted to the ones on M tilt, right? So some form omega on. M, we can lift it to some omega bar on M tilt. And omega bar will be invariant under tau, right? By definition, because it is going to be a lift and it descends to M as a regular standard form. So both forms, both regular objects on M and objects on M, on M tilt that are invariant under tau, we will call regular objects. Right, so these two categories objects, they're obviously in one to one relation and we will call them, call them regular objects. On the other hand, we may have a very specific category of objects on a tilt that are change their sign under push, push forwards or pullbacks by tau, depending on whether it's a vector field or a form. So it's, so tau, for example, of omega, uh, let me not use omega, let me use sigma for a subjective form. So if sigma, for example, is a symbolic form on M tilt on M tilt, then tau of tau star of sigma is going to be minus sigma. And if a function, for example, takes opposite values on two preimages of x prime uh, of x, so f of x prime is minus f of x double prime, right? Then such functions on M tilt and such forms on tilt are called twisted forms and twisted functions. If a vector field takes, you know, is minus the vector field under the push forward, then we call this a twisted vector field. So yeah, this is again, this bit slightly worse drawn. Now the question is, how do we interpret these objects on M? Well, um, on M, we can think of them the following way. If we have some neighborhood U, of the point X. Uh, then once we set orientation on this neighborhood U, our twisted objects become regular objects uh, for the following reason. We may interpret them as well on M. Uh, we may think of them as pairs omega mu on M, where omega is the object and mu is the local orientation. Now we factor those objects by the equivalence relation, whereas omega mu is equivalent to minus omega and minus mu. So once we set an orientation in a neighborhood U of a point X and M, our twisted objects become regular objects locally, right? But if we change the orientation, they become minus themselves. So, for example, a twisted scalar gamma becomes scalar gamma upon, after setting an orientation, and if we change this orientation, it immediately becomes minus gamma. Uh, twisted scalars are, will be of most interest to us, and they can be interpreted additionally as sections of the orientation bundle of a tilt. So, yeah. This is what I have been saying. Usually the space of twisted K forms is denoted by omega tilt K of M as opposed to standard orientation of uh, standard notation of omega K of M. On orientable manifolds, we have the Hodge star, right? Which sends K forms to N minus K forms. And on non-orientable manifold, we cannot have Hodge star because it requires orientation. But what we can have is the so-called twisted Hodge star 
which we denote by asterisks with the tilde, and it sends twisted k forms to regular n minus k forms on our non orientable manifold. Now, let's talk. So, having said that, let's talk about how we can redefine vorticity. Because the first problem that we encounter that I have been talking about is vorticity of the fluid. So, for an orientable manifold and tilde, the standard interpretation of vorticity is a vector field of normals, right, on this manifold, which tells us again whether we're going counterclockwise or clockwise, depending on the orientation, and the length of this no vector normal to the surface is going to be equivalent to the sort of velocity with which we're circulating. This will not work if a manifold is non-orientable, obviously. So we have to circumvent it somehow. We say that the flow of the fluid is given by some vector field V. Then because our fluid is considered to be incompressible, divergence of this vector field V is going to be zero. Now, we remember that our manifold is Romanian. So we can do the following. Um, let us take, uh, raise the index, I think I always confuse those. So we, well, yeah, well, we'll multiply it by a metric, turning, into, turning it into one form. And then we differentiate this one form to get a two form, which we denote by lambda. And this is what we call our vorticity two form. For orientable manifolds, it can be checked that hot star of lambda is going to be sort of the coefficient here, the length of this vector, right? So it makes, it is natural, and this makes sense on orientable manifolds. But on non-orientable manifolds, what we're going to do is apply twisted hot star to our two form lambda to get omega, which is going to be a twisted scalar on M which we call the scalar vorticity. Uh, now, if we turn back to our point vortices, right, we know that our scalar vorticity has to be gamma delta of x zero of x. And dealing with Dirac delta function as a twisted function is too much of a pain. So we say, let us delegate all the twistedness to this gamma over here. Now, why do we do it? Well, as I said, gamma, the sign of gamma, tells us which way, where, which way the fluid is going on the manifold. And a very good analogy that is due to change is the following. Um, let us have a Möbius band and let us have a couple of point vortices on it, right? And because Möbius band is a non-orientable manifold, we can think of it as being made out of clear plastic and the point vortex drawn at it with a marker. So if we turn it over, right, the point vortex will start going the other way. But we cannot find, we cannot understand, well, we cannot figure out whether we have turned over a Möbius band because it's made out of clear plastic. There is no indication of whether it has been turned over. So we cannot, so the orientation, so sorry, so the sign of gamma has to change with the, with the local orientation and therefore gamma has to be a twisted scalar. Now, the problem, the big problem, is that, as I said, twisted scalars are sections of the orientation bundle. And, well, regular scalars can be interpreted as sections of trivial line bundle in the manifold, right? But there are no, every, so on an orientable manifold, gamma, the section can be everywhere and on zero. And that is not the case for an orientation bundle, right? Because if we take the section of the orientation bundle and stand somewhere over here, we have to return, we have to go on the orientation changing loop and return back to here. So we have to be zero. Uh, how do we go around this once again? And um, here comes my personal least favorite construction in this whole thing. So let U1 and U2 be some charts on our non-orientable manifold. And then we take gamma to look as follows. So it will be some sort, so it will be a section and it will be some sort of partition of unity like construction, whereas it will be constant on some support of gamma and then it will dwindle away into zero, right? And 
technically we take an atlas first and then choose gum choose this section so that its support is big enough so that it is bigger than any open chart on this manifold right and we suppose that this if x0 is the center of the point vortex then this section moves rigidly with this point vortex so what does it give us if we have an open chart u and the center x0 of the point vortex in here if we restrict our attention to this chart only and establish our orientation on it, right? This section of the orientation bundle becomes a scalar. So we can say, oh yeah, we have established the orientation. This vortex on this chart goes, decidedly goes this way, say, say anticlockwise. But if we change the orientation, gamma turns into minus gamma. As uh, sections of the uh, as twisted scalars are wont to do, so this is that. But again, written way worse. So having sorted out our vorticity and having sorted out our uh, strength of the point vortex, we may now talk about the phase space. Um, it is very tempting. So we suppose once again that our manifold on our non-orientable manifold M. We have endpoint vortices at the centers x1, xn, with twisted point vortex strength gamma 1, gamma n. And it is very tempting to say that, analogously to the orientable case, why don't we have the phase space, which will be just n copies of m, right? But this is not true. This does not happen. Well, so let us discuss why this won't happen. Um, in order to formulate this, we follow the approach of Marston and Weinstein. Uh, so forgetting about point vortices for a moment, if we have fluid flow on a manifold uh, with vorticity two form lambda, uh, the phase space for the dynamics, so the initial vorticity two form is lambda, the phase space for the dynamics will be the orbit of lambda, the orbit which consists of the pullbacks of lambda under our familiar group of as diffeomorphisms of M, because once again, fluid is incompressible. Uh, the symplectic form is given by Kirill of constant, constant surreal form, which is going to be omega lambda of lead derivative of lambda along the vector field, along a divergence free vector field U, and lead derivative of lambda against, uh, along the divergence vector field V, divergence free vector field V, is going to be the integral of M of lambda of UV along some measure area measure that is consistent with our metric, which we assume to exist. So this is the symplectic form. This is the uh, standard phase space. Now, if our manifold is orientable, then our two form, initial two form, can be written as sum of j, gamma j, delta, I'm gonna say x zero j, which are the initial positions of our vortices, right? initial posi positions are our centers, gamma zero of xj, sigma, where sigma is the symplectic form. And as we can see, because point vortices move more or less freely on the manifold, we can do the following identification. Interpol of points belonging to m tilde times m tilde times m tilde, our orientable manifold, will be sent into this form, right? Gamma j delta of xj sigma. Uh, and this will be our phase space. This will be our orbital lambda. So the phase space is the one we're familiar with and copies of M tilde minus delta. Um, and copies of M tilde minus delta. And the symplectic form also simplifies a lot to the one we have seen before. Sum of gamma j sigma of xj u of uj vj. Can I ask a question? Yes, sure. Do you have, do you have two synthetic forms here? Uh, yeah. You have sigma so, to start with, oh, then you oh, define oh. another one. Uh, uh, which one, sorry? Uh, the sigma to start with. So on the previous page, you defined uh, uh, the name of the synthetic form, none of the, the, the one, uh, even before that. Uh, ah, so um, so what I'm saying is that, uh, yeah, sorry, I, I didn't make this clear enough. So, okay, okay, so, okay. so uh, maybe I didn't make the question clear. So for all these discussions, you, do you start with a fixed synthetic form, uh, sigma on MTL? Yeah. 
And then you define another symplectic form, right? Ah, right. So symplectic, so um, symplectic form sigma is on m tilde, as you rightly said, right? But this big symplectic form is on all lambda, which is m tilde times m tilde times m tilde. Oh, okay, 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 right, right. right minus right. delta. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so what so what I'm saying is that phase space of the fluid motion, right, is this or lambda. Phase space of the, of the fluid motion is this lambda, and this phase space is a symplectic manifold in on itself. Right? Phase space of motion of fluid on a symplectic manifold of tilt. Uh, so, but yeah, we're using sigma, symplectic form and m in defining our sigma lambda. So yeah. When we have orientable, an orientable manifold M, Marx and Weinstein approach to, flu, to symplectic interpretation of fluid dynamics, if you will, gives us this, gives us the standard approach, Hamiltonian approach that we have mentioned before. Now, uh, what we are saying here effectively, yeah, I should scroll back. What we're saying in here by this, and by, define, by having this and copies of m tilde minus delta as a phase space is that if we have an orientable manifold m tilde and we have a couple of point vortices strewn about gamma three and we know their centers and we know their the location of their centers and we know their scale of vorticities, we know everything there is to know about our system, right? Uh, we don't need any more information, we can go ahead describing it. Now, that is not the case for a non-orientable manifold. Why? Well, because, say, let's draw a Mobius band again, let's have some chart Q and let's orient it locally. If we have a point vortex on it, due to orientation, we can say it's twisted scalar, it's, um, the twisted scalar that it's point vortex strength turns into a scalar locally, gamma. Now, um, let us send this point vortex on this way in an orientation changing loop. So when it comes back, it will have, it will be rotating the opposite way, right? Because we have sent it on an orientation changing loop. It will be rotating the opposite way. So it is not enough to know where our point vortices are placed. We need to know some sort of inbuilt intrinsic orientation of this point vortex. So we can do the following, sort of. If we have a point vortex and we have an oriented chart, we can draw a little basis on this point vortex, right? And this little basis helps us determine whether we've been on an orientation changing loop or not, because we compare sort of inbuilt orientation of this point vortex to the orientation on our neighborhood U, and then we, and that allows us to determine, say, the sign of gamma, for example, and whether the sign of gamma has changed. So what the information that we need about the point vortex is its center x zero and a plus or a minus, which tells us whether the orientation of this point vortex coincides with the orientation of the oriented chart. And if x0 belongs to some non-orientable manifold M, then the set of x0 with pluses and minuses is precisely its orientable double cover, right? M tilde. Therefore, yeah, that's again, that, that bit's drawn slightly worse. We can say, we can formulate this proposition here. The phase space or lambda for a system of point vortices and non-orientable manifold is parameterized by N copies of M tilde which is going to be our do orientable double copy, uh, orientable double cover, minus delta tilde, where delta tilde is a very big diagonal, which consists of all the points x1 prime, xn prime in this m tilde to the power of n, for which the projections coincide. So we do not allow the point whose projections coincide either. Uh, now, uh, let us talk about the covering system. So in order to formulate a Hamilton, in order to write the Hamiltonian, 
And in order to write the symplectic form in this bigger manifold, we need to talk about how um, the dynamics of a system of a certain system of point vortices on M tilt and the dynamics of a system of point vortices on M will coincide. So for a system of point vortices on, uh, sorry, there. Okay, so for a system of point vortices on M, we may introduce a system of point vortices on M tilt, which will be its so-called double cover. We do it the following way. So we identify centers of point vortices, which are going to be X1, Xn, right, uh, on M, X1, Xn. And they will have some twisted scale of vorticities, gamma 1, gamma, uh, twisted, scale, uh, twisted scale of vortex strength, sorry, gamma 1, gamma N. Then what we do, as we know, we can construct vorticity to form lambda on M, right? And then we pull it back under pi to M tilt to get a form pi star lambda on M tilt. Then we do the following thing. We consider pre-images of the centers of point vortices, say x1 prime and x1 double prime. And then we compare orientation, right, at x1 prime induced by lambda, induced by p star lambda and orientation induced by the form sigma, the total, the symplectic form on it. If the orientations coincide, we say that we put strength gamma at x prime. If the orientations are opposite, we put minus gamma, right? So this way we make a choice between placing gamma and minus gamma on either x prime or x double prime on the two pre-images. So that is how we lift our system of point vortices. And we call X prime our preferred lift, usually. And I will talk about how this affects if I have time. So in the end, the system of N point vortices on M lifts to a system, with, uh, lifts to a system of two N point vortices on M tilt with strength, scalar strength gamma one gamma N placed at X one prime, X N prime N and minus gamma one minus gamma n placed at x1 double prime, xn double prime. So again, returning to our, returning to our system of point vortices on the Mobius band, we suppose that this is a point vortex with strength gamma, right? Gamma may be positive, gamma may be negative, we're not concerned with that. So this is x or the same as x prime. And we are, so we take our Mobius band, right? And we take the two pre-images on the cylinder. On this half of the cylinder, right? Our local orientation coincides with the orientation of the Mobius band. So we place at X prime, a point vortex of strength gamma. And X double prime is our other pre-image. We place a point vortex of strength minus gamma. And indeed it is going the opposite way. So if we have a point vortex here, say, going this way, gamma two, right? Its two pre-images will be this point vortex placed identically here, and the point vortex placed here of strength minus gamma two. So the system of two point vortices in the Mobius band is thusly lifted to the system of four point vortices on the cylinder. And the dynamics, what is most important to us, the dynamics of this system of four point vortices on the cylinder will cover the dynamics of the two point vortices on the Mobius band. And now using this, for every point vortex, X1, Xn, we choose the preferred lift X prime, X, uh, well, Xi prime, and look at which, uh, look at gammas, at this, the strength of the point vortex at this preferred lift. So we establish that and we can write this symplectic form on M, on M tilt times M tilt times M tilt minus delta, which is our phase space in this form, gamma K, sigma K, where again, sigma J is the symplectic form of J's copy of M tilt and gamma K, a strength of our point vortices at our preferred lifts. And a little bit of computation can show that the changing 
between changing our preferred lift between x y prime and x y double prime does not affect our subjective form. So this is well defined. Now for the Hamiltonian, let us write the uh, the Hamiltonian we write on m tilde first. So we have the covering system will be x1 xn gamma 1 gamma n tau of x1 tau of xn gamma 1 minus gamma 1 minus gamma n. So this is writing our standard Hamiltonian for this set of points, right, for this set of point vortices. So we have gamma of xi prime and xj prime tau, gamma of tau of xj prime, tau of xj prime, gamma i gamma j of x y prime tau of x j prime. So um, these two tau is, uh, tau preserves the, oh, go, go, got it both, lengths, isometry. I forgot the word isometry. Tau is an isometry. So Green's function and hence the Robbins function are invariant under isometries. So these two terms, for example, will coincide. And in here, every two terms in here will coincide as well. So in order to write, but this is the Hamiltonian on n copies of m tilde, right? So in order to write it intrinsically on m, we choose, we define the following functions. Let x prime be the preferred lift of x, preferred lift of x, and y prime preferred lift of y. Having chosen them, we can define functions on m as through functions on m tilde. Right? So this will be a function on M tilde, but this will be a function on M. So GM of XY is going to be Green's function on M tilde of X prime Y prime minus Green function on M tilde of X prime tau of Y prime. And this will be the twisted Green's function as in exchanging tau, exchanging between X prime and tau of X prime changes its sign. The regular Robbins function, we define this way. Rm of x is going to be r tilde, Robin's function on m, on m tilde, of x prime minus Green's function tilde of x prime and tau of x prime. Now, the proposition is that indeed, gm is the twisted Green's function on the, of the Laplacian on, on m, and rm is the regular Robin function on gm of x and y. So what am I trying to say here is that delta x of gm of x, y is going to be of x of y, um, it is going to be a twisted Dirac delta function, but we don't have time, but believe me if I know this is good. This is going to be the twisted Dirac delta function. That means that it turns infinite when x coincides with y and is zero otherwise. And that is as much as we can ask with Green's function really. And Rm is the desingularization of Green's function. So it's a limit minus logarithm of distance between x and y. So a little bit of computation shows us. And it is uncanny how a twisted function, the desingularization of a twisted function and taking the limit can turn it into a regular function on a manifold. So therefore the Hamiltonian of a system of endpoint vortices on M can be rewritten intrinsically in a very standard form for the Hamiltonians. So it's going to be minus gamma i gamma j gm of xi and xj minus one half sum of vorticity square rm of xj. And this Hamiltonian will be insensitive to change of orientation as well. So it is a well-defined function on the Mobius band. Uh, okay, I do not have time to talk about this. Um, this long scary function is the Hamiltonian for the Möbius band. So we return to our Möbius band, y equals zero. Points x, k, y, k are the centers of the point vortices and vorticities are gamma k. So this is going to be our Green's function. And Robin's function, Rm of x, is going to be uh, one over four pi logarithm of hyperbolic cosine of y, k, well, over R, right? So that means that the Robin function is not zero and one point vortex should move. Uh, skipping the equations of motion. Now, as I said, point vortices are a Hamiltonian system. So since uh, our Hamiltonian system on the plane is a standard one, zero, one, minus one, zero, same in the cylinder, right? So equations of motion of a point vortex on a Mobius band locally, are going to be one over gamma k 
d Hamiltonian over dyk and y dot k is going to be minus one over gamma k dh over dxk, right? Locally, we set the orientation. Gamma k turns scalars, turn into scalars, and we can perform and we can write these equations. So let's consider one point vortex on the Mobius band again. So it's, this is his center. And equations will look like this. So that means, say, gamma is greater than zero. That means that the point vortex will move in this direction, right? It will reach the imaginary boundary here. And then something has to happen, right? So this point is the same as this point over here. But our point vortex jumps over the imaginary boundary. So it has to change its local orientation. And since gamma is a twisted scalar, this point vortex will now go this way. So what does that mean? That means that x dot is that gamma turns into minus gamma and y turns into minus one. So x dot is one is well, yeah, one minus one over four pi gamma, hyperbolic tangent of minus y, and y dot is equal to zero. So overall, this tangent gamma is an odd function, nothing changes. So the vector field, so it will move again to the right, to the right, to the right, to the right, and Till it reaches the boundary here, whereas it has to jump again, change the way it is rotating again, and continue moving. So one point vortex on the Mobius band will go on big circles like so. Go in circles this way. And to an observer who's just looking at it, say on orientable, oriented little neighborhood, it's going to periodically change uh, the way which it's going. Now, um, the last one of the, probably the last thing I want to say is the following. Um, this system, we may write, the moral of this whole thing is that we may write local equations of motion, which we have just seen on this slide, right? We may write local equations of motion on a chart, but we may not write globally defined Hamiltonian equations of motion because our manifold is not symplectic, right? Because there is no existing symplectic form. So let us construct a Hamiltonian uh, uh, vector field, air quotations, in for one point vortex. So let U1 and U2, right, be the two charts that cover our Mobius band. So we will have u1 with this orientation, u2 with the same orientation, and then u1 again has to have the opposite orientation. So as we have seen before, right, the vector field will go x dot is 1 over 4 pi gamma hyperbolic tangent of y. So on this chart, it will go this way above. And since the change of what, since the sign of y changes, it will go this way under the line y equals 0. Right? So the point vortex moves, 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 comes to this chart here, U2, where the orientation is not changed. So once again, neither the sign of Y or the sign of gamma change. So the vector field will be going right on the top and left on the bottom. Now, goes, 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 goes to, comes here. Now, again, we change the orientation. So both gamma and Y change. So now at the points here, we will have the vector field that goes to the right. And at the points here, we will have a vector field that goes to the left. But the catch is this point here is the same as this point here, right? And we're sticking out to the right here and we're sticking out to the left in here. So the moral is this is not a well-defined vector field in the Mendius band, but we can write equations locally of motion on each chart. And as point vortex moves from one chart to the other, the trajectories can be glued together. So the equations are locally defined, but the motion is globally defined. And the last thing, last little thing, which I think is interesting is, this is not a Hamiltonian vector field, but this is the fluid flow created by solitary point vortex on the Mobius band. So this will be the center of the vortex and there will be those big separatrices. So I just thought I'll end it as something that looked pretty for the end. Um, yeah, that's all that I wanted to say. And thank you very much.